Okay, um, over to you, Monique. Thank you, thanks, Ellen. Hi, everyone, I'm Monique Ho. Welcome and thank you for joining the third B slash event. A quick introduction of myself, I work at BE Systems Supply Intelligence as a management consultant. I'm experienced in business analysis, business change, cybersecurity, particularly interested in um, corporate innovation and um, agile transformation. Today, I'm joined by Alan, another organizing committee. Alan, would you like to quickly introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hi guys. Um, I'm Al. I've, uh, I've been involved with BA Slash um, from the uh, first event where I volunteered as, uh, as an organizer. Uh, I've been a BA for a few years, um, probably using agile methods since around um, 2001 with uh, an exponent of uh, XP. Um, but for me, it's not necessarily about what methodology we use. It's about making sure that we record and convey um, the requirements to people effectively. I'm pretty agnostic when it comes to uh, the method I use to um, either record or just communicate what I'm trying to get through to people. So yeah, welcome, that's me. That's great, cool, thank you, Alan. Next slide. So yeah, so just wonder actually whether this is the, the first event for, for you as well. So if we can all have do a quick poll on Zoom. So um, have you attended our event before? So if you can um, indicate that in the poll, that would be great. This, this one is uh, probably a little bit um, previous. Um, I should have put this on uh, two different slides. So if you could just answer the uh, first question, that'd be great. For some reason, the poll is not popping up for me. Um, uh, I think that if you go to the, um, the, the panel, I think that might just be because you're um, an admin. Okay. Andrew said they can see the poll but can't select an answer. Oh, that's. Oh, okay. Let's see what, what happens. Yeah, for some reason that, uh, that hasn't worked. Let's try again. Oh, yay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, so sorry about this. Yeah, just uh, try again. It should be up running now. Cool, we got the first person project, so it's definitely working. Ooh. We got our 50 50 at the moment. So I'll leave the, the poll open while I'm just kind of introduce um, BA Slash as well. So um, for, for those who have joined um, BA Slash events before, uh, you may have heard of the story about why I started BA Slash Group to offer some no cost but high quality events. And the other reason of setting up BA Slash is that world, you know, technology, landscape, um, business models, they are all evolving so quickly that the needs of roles in general in organizations are changing as well. So it's really important that you and me proactively equip ourselves to ensure that we got the, the latest insights and techniques that we can add value to your roles, your projects, and stay competitive as well. So BA Slash is a community for for everyone, so do spread the word with your contacts, tweet us, follow us on LinkedIn and on YouTube and ignore these. So to date, I actually checked just now. Um, we have, let me do a drum roll. We got two, 260 plus sign up to, to BA Slash community. So thank you very much for, for your support so far and let's grow the community stronger together. So, a few 
um, housekeeping points. So the first one is um, you will receive the, the slide deck as well as the recording of this session. So um, rest assured, don't, don't worry about emailing us. We'll get it out to, to you as soon as possible. And your line is muted at the moment is because we are doing a recording of this section. So um, please feel free to unmute your line at the end when we are doing the Q&A. You can also put your questions in the, the chat box where Alan will be collating and um, basically asking the questions towards the end. Last, but as important, that you are very welcome to stay behind for our virtual social and networking and you can meet other participants and, and chat about your day or have any questions on um, the work that you have at the moment as well. It's great that today we have Ed to talk us through some tips on user stories, a topic that's very close to part of many of us here. Ed is my former colleague at BAE. If I use three hashtags to introduce him, they are number one, debate, um, that's what Ed and, and me did when we first met at a business event. The second one that's um, inspired. So um, you can talk to him about his um, story of learning how to write good user stories and also his patience, all these really inspire me a lot. Um, and in return, I basically pass on my directness to, to Ed as well. Um, the last one is about stay, staying fit. So Ed is really good at keeping his exercise routine and he, he would remind me to do so as well because sometimes it can get quite hectic at work and running events like this and for, forget about how to exercise it. So yeah, so pick his brain on what's the best exercise that he would recommend to you as well. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Ed to share his learning on user stories. Here you go, Ed. Thank you very much, Monique. Uh, I've never been described by hashtags before. It's the first time for everything. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, I think that should be sharing for everyone. Um, so before I kick off, just a bit of an introduction to what I'm trying to do here. So I've been on various projects where user stories are used. Um, I felt when I first started writing user stories many years ago, um, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I felt that a lot of people go into this, they see a lot of theory on the internet, they get a few lessons, but they don't actually understand how to actually make their user stories useful. And by this presentation, I'm sort of hoping to describe the information that I hoped I would have been told at the beginning of my journey. Um, instead of sort of figuring, figuring, figuring it out in the process. And that's sort of what I want to describe here. Um, so who am I? Uh, let me get this working. Um, so I'm Ed Highlands. I currently work at NTT Data, um, which is a consultancy firm. I have eight years experience, primarily in IT transformation projects. I've worked in both agile and water for deliveries and a few other types of things as well. Um, however, um, I mostly focus on the agile areas in um, deliveries now, um, and you might sort of see that in the way I maybe have a bit of favoritism towards agile versus waterfall, maybe throughout the presentation. So before um, I actually go into the details, um, for people who are not clear, I just wanted to do a tiny little recap of what user stories are. So user stories generally have two key components. You have a user story statement, which is the intent behind the functionality you need to build. And it has a set structure. You have a role, which is the role who wants the piece of functionality you're building. Uh, they want to be able to do something, which is the functionality you are building. And they need to benefit somehow, and that's the value um, of what you're building for that user. And that's sort of a set formula that's used for every single user story. A user story is pretty much just like a requirement. Um, it's just a different form of writing them that got popular with agile practices. Um, against a user story, you also generally have a list of acceptance criteria, which provide the detail to allow the story to be built and tested. They sort of define the acceptable behavior for that story.
Um, so this is what I think you would normally get taught if you were going to learn about user stories. There's uh, checklists for criteria you need to follow when writing your stories. There's behavior uh, personas that you might want to link into your stories. There's behavior driven developments. There's given when then formula for writing stories and acceptance criteria. You could talk about business story. You could talk about enabler stories, which are sort of the technical enablers. You've got approaches to capturing stories, approaches to capturing epics and features. There's design thinking, design sprints, free amigos, free sees. There's a lot of information on this area. And I sort of felt it's a bit, especially when you first get into it, it's a bit too much. And it's very hard to sort of get any learnings from any of these areas. And you also need to understand things like product roadmaps, portfolio roadmap, roadmaps, prioritization techniques, relative estimation, as well as your general requirement model uh, in itself, i.e. do you have stories, epics, acceptance criteria? do you have super epics, do you have features, how, what level of information do you have at each level? I don't really want to cover anything like that in this session. I sort of want to take it back one step and I want to sort of cover what I feel is normally missed. Um, one of those things that I think is missed is people actually considering one, what type of delivery are we actually using these stories for? Um, because depending on the type of delivery you're doing, you might want to tailor your stories in a different way. I would also want to talk about what information actually needs to be associated to your stories. Thirdly, who, are, who is actually using these user stories, i.e. who are the people who are consuming and digesting your user stories? And for what is the life cycle of a user story? And in this session, I'm gonna run through at a, a relatively high level each one of these points um, and talk about some of the things that I would consider depending on what type of scenario that I was in because I believe there is no set standard for how you should always write a user story and you always need to tailor it for the situation that you're in. So let's start off with uh, the type of delivery stories are used for. Um, I think we were going to try a poll here, but um, Alan, I'm not sure if we want to try it or skip it. I'm gonna be brave, Ed. <laughs> so, um, so we were trying to do a poll for what type of scenarios people who have used user stories themselves in this, in this group to see what type of mix that we have. Um, I've actually used it in all of these scenarios as it stands. I think that's a good mix. It's mostly for agile deliveries. Right, let's, let's end that and uh, hopefully we'll share the results. Can, can you tell us what the others were, Alan? That'd be interesting to see as well. Um, not actually had the other in chat yet. So if you have uh, put, uh, <clears throat> put other, then uh, just type it in chat and uh, Ed can uh, just have a cover off some of those. If not, I will just continue. Um, so the most popular, um, so user stories became a popular approach for writing requirements in Agile deliveries. It makes sense that the majority of people here have used them in Agile deliveries. Um, so how would I imagine uh, requirements in Agile are written? It, it, they're very slightly different per type of delivery you go for. So in Agile, you would have stories broken up by sprint. You would have close collaboration between yourself and the development team and various design and UX, et cetera, teams to elaborate both business and technical information within the stories. Um, so that's how I would see uh, stories in Agile. And it's very much incrementally broken down functionality in prioritized stories. However, if we sort of go onto wa waterfall, 
you can imagine we've got a slightly different thing here. The requirements that you have in Waterfall, um, you can call them user stories or requirements. They're pretty much the same thing. It's just a different form of writing them. Waterfall, you've got various transitions that you're handing requirements onto. And you have to think about this. Are your requirements being created at the beginning of the project and then being handed over to a design team who would then be handed on to a delivery team? How much involvement do you get throughout those different phases? Do you just sit at the very beginning and just pass them over? And you can imagine if you were trying to create requirements for this type of scenario, you would need to, in a way, tailor them for sort of a high-ish, medium level of information to allow people to elaborate details and low-level technical details throughout the different phases, but ensure that you're actually meeting the business functionality you need to. So it's a little bit harder here. The next scenario I've seen user stories used is a few other people had as well, is contracts. I've actually been in two um, different deliveries that have needed requirements and contracts now. So contracts is a difficult one. Um, I find there's always been a lot of conversation for what you need to have in a contract related requirement. Um, however, as a main thing, I would say, in this sort of case, you're sort of, it's sort of like waterfall. You need, you're handing it over to a group of people, but don't go too low level because I, my experience is you just end up changing things over and over again. Um, you've also got uh, handing over requirements for an external team. You might be working within your own little team and you've got a third party who has to deliver some sort of functionality. You need to provide requirements for those. You might be writing them in user story format. For these scenarios, I sort of see the user stories more as a checklist, i.e. what is the checklist of things that you would want that external team to cover um, in order for you to deliver it. And the last scenario I see uh, stories used more and more now, actually, is just general team management. I see lots of people just uh, not actually doing deliveries at all, just uh, using agile and user stories to uh, do general workload management within their own teams. And I've seen quite a few different examples across many different industries where people are using user stories just to organize different people doing different forms of work and why are they doing that work and for what benefits and prioritizing those. And the reason I wanted to talk about all these different types of deliveries is just to get you thinking. One size fits all does not work, as you can see, the requirements slash user stories are actually being used for very different purposes in each of these scenarios. And therefore you really need to start thinking, you will need to start tailoring your approach for the type of delivery you're working for. For example, if you had written requirements in an agile delivery, I would expect you to write them very differently in a waterfall delivery. At least that's what I would do. So the next thing, um, I would consider is what information needs to be associated to your user stories. Um, so I'll run through them one by one uh, as we go. So as I said in Agile, um, you normally get stories definition of ready for a sprint, let's say a week or so before the sprint starts. Um, that's sort of when it's gonna be delivered by your delivery team. Um, at this point for agile deliveries, you, know, you don't just have the stories and acceptance criteria. You could have far more bits of information elaborated associated to your story. You could have user X designs, you might have processes. I often see technical details for how we actually deliver that story. There might be uh, test scenarios for what we want to cover. Uh, I've been worked in many different agile teams and for I always find that information on the technical side is always elaborated and always useful, but the amount of information always differs. Um, but for Agile, I'd consider, what do I need to include within my story? I'd say before it goes into delivery, I need to work with lots of people to get the story corrected. I need the acceptance criteria corrected. I need to get the technical details for how to deliver it. I need to get the UX and visual design details for it, how it needs to be delivered. So there's a lot to consider and collaborate on that. On Waterfall, as we said, you have to work out when are you doing your first transition to handover? 
if you're handing over to a, a design team or who are going to elaborate the solution for this is that your handover point what type of requirements would you need if you're handing over to that are you working with a design team on your set of user stories that will then hand over to a delivery team so you have to think about what is your transition point for what type of information that you need to associate to your stories because you can't go low 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 de level detail especially if you don't really know what the solution is let's just say you were building a website um, you can't break down the stories as you would for agile for the different chunks of functionality if all you know at this point is you need capabilities to deliver something but you don't actually know what the website will look like um, so your requirements could be at a very different level um, for contracts um, it's very similar i would say consider uh, considerations as waterfall um, but something i would never forget in contracts is your nfrs um, which is as many people know it's a bane of some it deliveries you always need to be careful of slas you need to be careful of performance you need to be careful of what devices you can actually use the site on um, that would be something i'll be focusing very strongly on if i was doing anything that was in a contract for um, external teams again as i said it's probably more similar to this waterfall area it's you it's basically if another team is delivering something that goes into my system what are the checklist of things that i want to be able to get from them to say they've delivered it i don't really want them coming back and saying it wasn't in your requirements therefore we haven't delivered it therefore what level of detail do you think you have to go to so you don't have to have those conversations um, and for workload management uh, it's pretty simple here whatever is useful for the team to work on um, sometimes people don't put the full user story sometimes they're a bit quick and dirty uh, but it's just whatever is useful for the team to help them prioritize the work that they're doing so that is the second thing i would consider um, when before i even started writing a single user story for a charge project i was on the next area i would look at is who's actually using the user stories um, so remember you're not writing a user story for yourself um, generally the user stories are for other people to use for various purposes and requirements and user stories are used differently by different user groups and they're all trying to get something different out of it for myself when i'm writing user stories the main thing that i care about that uh, product managers and business stakeholders care about is is the scope clear that's one do i know what i'm getting is the scope prioritized in those stories and that's really all i care about in the stories that i have just thinking about myself do I know what is prioritized? Does the business know what they're getting? Is everything in the right order? But that's not what everyone else cares about. And therefore you need to tailor your story so it's actually useful for everyone. For example, testers, they need to know um, how to actually test the functionality. Is, do they have enough information to actually test each story as delivered? Is each acceptance criteria clear enough for someone to actually test and tick it off? Do they understand the various scenarios that they may need to test in order to make sure your product actually works and all the bugs are actually found? For developers, they need to be able to understand clear, discrete areas of functionality that they can build. They don't want to have multiple overlapping stories where they're sort of guessing what they need to deliver. It's probably one of the reasons I dislike Waterfall slightly is because I generally find from experience and from talking to people uh, if things aren't clear developers generally just guess um, which doesn't happen as much in Azure which is one of my preferences um, then you go to the UX visual designer side so what do they care about they don't want to know the solution they want to know what is required from the user what are the key things the user needs to do but they don't want to know how it's done and that's a very clear thing on the user stories and acceptance criteria they should not be explaining the solution either the technical or visual um, they are pointers for other teams to lay down those technical information for what needs to be delivered 
as well as what does the end project look like? And you would be working closely with each of these stakeholder groups to elaborate the detail they need uh, against the story. Um, and the last key stakeholder I normally consider is the architects or the technical architects that you'll find. They are the people who are looking at the high level solution in general. They need to understand in my head, um, what, why is functionality needed? What are the priorities? Because based on if functionality is needed or not needed, or if we need to do something slightly differently where it's not very high priority, you can think about all the different solutions that we can deliver that will give some of the business needs, but not all of the business needs. But based on prioritization and what we need to deliver as part of this project, that would actually be more sensible for the business. So that's what I find a lot of architects care about. And I find you need to make sure you give these architects this information because you need to be able to do this in order to ensure you actually have clear scope that is prioritized based on both your view of prioritization as well as technical effort for it to be delivered. And these are, it's very important that both of these things are actually considered. And the last thing I would generally think about is the life cycle of a story. So I've sort of pulled up a V model um, just for ease sort of here um, as the general general end-to-end uh, -end process of requirements being created to coding and all the way through to testing, acceptance testing. Um, the main thing I just wanted to get out of this is when I start on a project, the first thing I normally ask is what is the life cycle of a user story? And what I normally like to do is, which I find is most people don't actually know the full life cycle, which means you have to talk to various different people. And that's you start building up the process yourself. And by understanding the process that a user story goes through for its life cycle, you can then also work out who are the people who are needing them, um, which helps you understand how they're being used as well as who uses them for therefore what information needs to be in them. And some of the questions I would generally have in this area are, when do stories become static? And it depends a lot on the delivery type, um, but it also depends on the project you're on for when do your stories not change? And are the processes that stories get changed later on? What if you're delivering something wrong? What happens then? Sort of understanding that sequence. Um, who is involved in the elaboration of the story before it becomes static? Um, it's all important to understand who should be involved and when. There could be many stakeholders. There might be just a few, um, but you need to understand clearly who's involved in that life cycle process. Um, then how is the development team actually using the stories? Um, sometimes they might be taking the stories and creating a separate document to create them. It's not my ideal preference, um, but unless you know how they're using them and what they actually need from the stories, how could you actually tailor it for what they need? Um, then who is testing the stories? Sometimes it's part of a dev team, sometimes it's part of a separate team. If it's part of a separate team, how much insight and interaction do they have with the dev team? How much interaction do they need with people who created the requirements so that they actually understand what needs to be delivered? Um, are the stories being used for UAT? Um, or is something else being used for UAT? Are the, are the stories being used to create user guides? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Um, and finally, are we mapping stories to releases? How is our release capability related to our stories? Can we, can we toggle on and off functionality so that we can release some stories, not others? It's all of these questions that I'd be trying to answer to make sure that the stories that I write and the stories I collect are tailored to the scenario that I have. So my key takeaways here, I'd say is, one, there's no perfect set approach for how you should document user stories, and what level of detail you need. I, I always don't like it when someone says, you need this level of detail in stories, you need this level of detail in epics, because the answer is there's no set level and it all depends on your scenario that you have and you need to tailor it for your project. And that's sort of my second takeaway. You need to consider your situation you're in and you need to tailor the approach to writing user stories 
based on those four main points that I brought out before you start considering all the different uh, other approaches for how you write stories or capture stories or invest models or story mapping you need to consider the situation you're in and what you need to capture and why and my third takeaway would be um, you don't get things perfect straight away um, there's a lot of people to engage to get things right um, and that would be therefore you need to be able to iteratively improve how stories are being documented can you look for a period of time or a release can you work out some learnings that can go back and iteratively improve how your user stories are written through time and generally seeing as user stories are used throughout the life cycle of a delivery this can have a lot of benefits and it can cause it can basically can stop problems occurring i generally find um so i know i haven't really gone much in the detail of what stories should be i've just got a few final slides that just one just gives a few, little bit of side advice and second i've just got a couple of examples that i just want to talk through um, and discuss so here's just a little bit of advice um, uh, separate from that um, so first never start just writing requirements by themselves you need to start thinking about the outcomes that you want in general can you link what you're delivering to a program strategy can you link something that you're doing through a company strategic theme it, it really needs to start from the bot top and go down never just start writing requirements down here because how do you know if what what you're building and what you're got down here is actually useful so i'd start on the top level structure and agree it and then you can get to your low level user stories when you've got the clear outcomes and scope of what you want to do um, my second point is follow invest criteria um, so if you do not know what that is um, invest stands for um, i is independent n is negotiable v is valuable e is estimatable s is small and t is testable test testable glad i actually remembered that um, so every single story and acceptance criteria um, i would actually say especially in the early, earlier time of your career of writing stories look at every single one of these points against every single one of your stories and acceptance criteria it's what i did at the beginning um, because i actually learned the hard way of what happens if you do not follow each one of these it just causes you problems um, i sort of do it naturally now um, but it's something that is very important to check and if you were ever going to review stories it's it's a very easy list that you can check every single story in ac against to make sure it's got a good level of quality um, um, third point is do not have long complicated story statements be short and concise um, no one wants to read massive long sentences keep it snappy what the user wants what the user what who the user is what the user wants and why don't make it long and complicated if you need other information documented against the story um, sometimes i've had to write i've written scenarios against the story just to give a bit more context of the history and why it's needed but i wouldn't put it in the story title it just gets a bit bloated um, so point number four um, two uh, between two and eight acceptance criteria per story um, any more suggests a story is too big or any less it suggests a bit of amb ambiguity another good reason between this number is you've you've generally got seven plus or two, minus two is what people can hold in their short-term memory just imagine if someone was building this and someone was testing this do they want to be able to build against something that has 30 40 acceptance criteria or do they want to build something that they can say this is a discrete piece of functionality with around seven uh, acceptance criteria which i can pretty much hold in my short-term memory it's just so much easier to build against and it is so much easier to test against um, because you can test small bits of functionality at a time and build small pieces of functionality at a time um, number five clearly clearly get your constraints and your acceptance criteria um, they will be a big part of your uh, testing acceptance testing i.e what needs to happen in various scenarios make sure that they're documented 
um, if you want to build against them. I know some people um, actually decide not to build um, to cover edge cases um, because it actually creates a lot of work to just uh, make sure all your edge cases work. Sometimes they just allow it to break, um, but you just need to under decide what you want to do there. Um, six, uh, do not put your solution in your acceptance criteria. I see this very often. Um, people saying the solution in your acceptance criteria is just an area you need to be a bit careful of here. And the last point I'd say is do not forget about NFRs. They are really important. Um, a red flag for me, if I ever draw in a project, is they do not have NFRs properly documented and people don't know what the NFRs are. You should document your NFRs at the beginning of the project or program. If you don't, you would just have problems later on. It, it always happens. Sometimes you decide not to build and test against these NFRs for speed, but it could also cause your program or project just to be shut down because it actually just needs to be completely reworked to actually meet the NFRs that you need to deliver. So that's also something very careful to look at. Um, I think I've got a little bit more time, so I'll just cover a few examples um, that I wanted to talk about um, because I know I didn't put any examples in the presentation. So I just wanted to have a few examples of some random stories and I pretty much just made up a few stories related to, let's say, a supermarket website. Just keep it nice and simple that everyone understands. So you might have a story as a new customer, which is the type of user you're talking about. I want to register online and that's sort of the functionality you're building um, so that I can save my details and preferences. Um, so that's a, the user story structure. And I just want to draw on the middle bit. That really is the most important part. Um, if you were writing a traditional requirement, you would pretty much just have this middle bit. Um, the benefit of user stories, it links us a user to it and a value to it. Um, but the bit that you're delivering is always this middle bit here, not anything over here. Um, it's something that some people um, don't always realize when they first look at it. Um, next, as a logged in customer, I want to find different groceries so that I can choose what I want to buy. So this is talking about finding different groceries on your site. Uh, you can have, a as a logged in customer, I want to add items to my basket so that I can then pay for them. All very nice and simple. As a premium member, I want to see deals applicable to me so that I can purchase them if I wish. Um, so these are all sort of high level user stories. You could consider them epics, but it all very depends on your situation. I'm just going to draw in one of these a bit more in a lower detail. So you might focus on being able to find the groceries. So I've just broken up a few acceptance criteria here, which could have been about finding things using the search bar, finding things using navigation functionality, uh, finding groceries from previous purchases. But just look at, look at this. This is still a bit high level. Um, how is someone going to go and build the functionality that they need uh, and test the functionality associated to this? So I would sort of, if I was especially working in an agile team, um, I would sort of go one level down. So focusing on this search bar functionality. Um, uh, as a logged in user, I want to search for groceries using the search bar so I can quickly find what I want to purchase. So the type of acceptance criteria I would cover here um, could be related to, have you considered auto completion of the search terms? A lot of people, when they think about search functionality, they think about Google capability. Um, a lot of standard search engines are not as good as Google, and they don't also always auto-populate it. And if those types of functional needs are actually needed by the business, you really want to know. Do you find things from partial searches or exact searches? What happens when you use special characters? What sort of happens if you use an asterisk or an at sign or an umlaut? Uh, what order do your results come back? How many items uh, appear on a page? What is the behavior if there's no results? Um, you can see these are a lot of different things you can consider and that this isn't a full list. And these acceptance criteria could actually be part of separate stories themselves. Maybe you work with the business and they prioritize a few of these types of areas that you want to work on. Maybe you have 
a story that deals with exact searches first, and then maybe in a later release or a later delivery, you work on the partial searches. It's all about prioritizing the functionality that you need in appropriate user stories and acceptance criteria. And I was hoping these three slides would just get a little bit of a view on how some user stories and acceptance criteria could be structured and some of the things that you would need to consider on them. And that um, is my presentation. Thank you for your time. And I hope it was useful. As I said, it's sort of the type of things that I wish I had been told when I first started it. But I do understand I haven't gone into a lot of detail for actually collecting the stories themselves. That would sort of have to be picked up maybe in a later session by someone else. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Apple, for sharing this. And you mentioned the kind of linking the user stories to strategy, the themes, um, really checking um, every single story against how they invest model. I think that those are very good tips. And I really like you mentioned that um, we, we need to understand who will be using our user stories. Because I think as a business analyst, we talk a lot about, yeah, we have to be user centric. So I think we have to demonstrate it, not just at the kind of uh, type of solution building level that we built uh, a user friendly solution. It's also about how we can make sure that our user stories are friendly to the users of the user story. So, yeah. Correct. Well, thank you so much. And I think we, we have got quite a lot of questions, Alan. So would you like to- Okay, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. so uh, yeah, plenty of questions. So, uh, Tough ones for you, Ed. Oh, God, I can't wait. <laughs> Monique, uh, feel free to jump in. And, and uh, there's uh, functions in, in Zoom, so if anyone has got comments, uh, you know, put a hand up and we'll, we'll try and bring you in as well. So um, if we kind of go back to um, your, your different scenarios, um, the, the other uh, was converting normal requirements to a user story. Ah, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I guess from that, we're, we're talking a, a kind of traditional waterfall requirement into a story. Yep, I, I, can, I can imagine doing that. I can't remember if I've ever done it before. Um, I but still do it. It's, I, have, I can see the, the scenario that someone wants to work more agile so that they need to have a value and a user against all their requirements now. I can imagine that was the painful process to go through, especially seeing as the requirements wouldn't have been suitable for agile <laughs> delivery anyway. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Um, so uh, another one there, uh, another question on this uh, type of use for them. Um, our user, this is from Dan. Uh, our user stories commonly used for teamwork management or is that quite rare? So around a few years ago, um, or three, four, five years ago, I, I started hearing about in sort of conferences, webinars, people using it in various scenarios. My favorite was someone using it in the some area of the NHS to sort of prioritize a bunch of changes that they needed within the NHS. Um, I know a few different teams within my company that use user stories to track the work that they need to do. I, I've seen examples now in a lot of different scenarios. Um, so the answer is, is it used? Yes. Is it used everywhere? No. Um, but I often see it used in projects where you need to track your deliverables each, each sprint on each piece of work. And how do you manage that effectively? You can just follow general agile scrum methodology and that sort of it doesn't need to just work with a delivery team it can be expanded out for just to manage your working to have a backlog of work can you prioritize the work your team needs to do in this sprint can you help each other make sure each of those bits get answered and delivered um, so yes i see it being used more and more going forward yeah, I think um, a lot of people might be aware of this. There, there is a, an agile outside of IT meetup group. Um, I think what's happened is, as uh, you know, as IT professionals brought in um, agile delivery and tried to engage much more with our stakeholders and our, you know, our customers, uh, and they've seen the benefit of how 
these stories are you know concise easy to understand and outline the benefits that you're trying to deliver uh, and so people are using it for um, a lot of other things um, let's uh, let's pick out I think we've got uh, a couple of more questions um, around acceptance criteria cool. um, so uh, Mohammed here uh, what's the difference between acceptance criteria DOR and DOD in user stories what should there uh, or should there be all three um, so um, for people who don't know, so definition of ready is a term in Agile used for what are the criteria for a story to be ready to start delivery and development and being picked up by a development team. Definition of done is the criteria that needs to be met for a story to be deemed done, delivered, signed off. Um, definition of re so a definition of ready and the definition of done, um, you would generally always have on a agile delivery um, at least a good one and you should also have acceptance criteria they serve very different purposes the acceptance criteria are the sort of the accepted if type of functionality that you need to actually build your uh, definition of ready may cover elements like uh, the technical details being associated to the story your definition of ready may include um, various sign-offs that might have to, have, have to happen on the story or the details that you need on the story. So it's sort of like a checklist for your delivery team to go, does this story meet the criteria that I can deliver it in the team without there being any problems? And the definition of the done is sort of covering the elements that you need to have included for the story to have been delivered. One of the things I'd always have in sort of the definition of done is some of the NFRs. So you don't want to add NFRs to every single one of your stories with acceptance criteria. I don't want performance compatibility um, and all those other types of uh, NFRs within it, but you'd have it as part of your definition of done for um, what things, what testing and functionality needs to be working. Um, does it need to work on like old iPhones or Windows Explorer? What's the performance? I.e., it can't be deemed as done until you know screen load is within half a second or something like that so, so they also in, in terms of that definition does that link into um, the amount of detail that you need to put into your acceptance criteria um so not really so the things that i'd put in the definition of done um is just anything that starts replicating across every single one of your stories um start thinking that's where definition of done <laughs> comes in handy because there's no point just replicating lots of different uh, acceptance criteria across stories. I've had to do it in the past when we haven't got anything ready for a definition or ready or definition of done, a sort of temporary measure, but it's not ideal because the definition of ready, definition of done sort of sits for a program of work. Let's say you had six or seven agile teams, you would be wanting them to have the same definition of ready for when they bring things in and the same definition of done for what they agree and this is sort of a, a agreement that would it be for all the teams across the delivery okay great um i think we're going to um wrap up there um i'm going to try and run our um our feedback poll again um just to um see whether that will work um so if um, anyone still in can uh, just give us a rating so um, we kind of know how we're uh, how we're doing uh, um, basically uh, any other comments that you've got put them into um, uh, the chat and uh, I'll hand you over to Monique great thank you thank you Alan yes and while you are doing the, the, the feedback the, the poll um, do stay in touch. So uh, we've already got the, the next event um, lined up for, for you. So that would be um, the end of July on product ownership in the safe environment, which is a topic that people are re really interested in, in terms of product ownership as well as how the safe environment. So yeah, so we've, we'll have my, my colleague from BAE, um, Dan Miskov, coming 
to, to speak to us, to share about his experience as well. Yeah. And um, last but not least, the, uh, the usual promotion that please join us um, if you are interested to um, organize events for your fellows here or suggest a topic or nominate your colleagues to present at BA Slash to bring more insights and knowledge to your fellows here. So do contact us. And if your company would like to sponsor our, our events, they're very welcome as well. Cool. So I'll, I'll leave that with you. And, um, and Alan and Ed, we will all be staying behind for our virtual show show. So do join us if you are interested in, in this. Otherwise, I'll, I'll wrap up the day and stop the recording. We have to thank you so much for joining us tonight and hope you have a really good evening. And, uh, and thank you, Ed. Uh, really good presentation. Great to see uh, some context around uh, user stories and, and real life use. Yeah, it was fun to do. It was fun to do. Cool. So if anyone wants to uh, join us, feel free to unmute, switch on your um, video and say hello. Thank you all. See you later.